Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, that's for art, and I'm going to read a little bit more from our book Poison Power, written by Drs. John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin. As you can see, the subtitle is The Case Against Nuclear Power Plants, which evidently was summarily ignored. We are now on page 78. We're still on chapter 3, How Radiation Produces a Disease and Hereditary Alterations. So we're at the top of the first paragraph on page 78. <clears throat> and the pressure of such promotional interest is staggering. All they need to do is mention the magic words economics and everyone falls into line. If it is not economical to prevent radioactive pollution, then assuredly we must allow the pollution to occur unimpeded, which is what they've been doing. That we may put an enormous price in the future I'm sorry, that we may pay an enormous price in the future through deterioration of our genes and chromosomes and thereby cause fantastic human misery and suffering hardly enters this economic picture. This is not because the proponents of atomic and other technologies are hard-hearted evil individuals bent upon injury to humans. Far from it. Well, I'm not so sure I agree with him there. Uh, the apparent insensitivity arises from our widespread false definition of the term economic. We only include short-term considerations in our economic calculations, those concerned with days, weeks, months, or even a few years. More ultimate costs to be borne by future society or future generations are hard to anticipate. They almost appear theoretical and they are routinely avoided in economic considerations. Another common but unsatisfactory answer is given for why we would legally permit enough radiation. Let me see this again. Another common but unsatisfactory answer is given for why we would legally permit enough radiation and radioactive contamination to cause a 10% increase in mutation rate. We are already being irradiated, they say, from natural sources. That's what we hear all the time now. Cosmic rays, radioactivity of substances in the Earth's crust, carbon-14 produced by cosmic rays in an amount that can also cause about 10% of the spontaneous mutation rate. As this specious argument goes, we can do much harm, we can't do much harm, if we do to humans only the equal of what nature is already doing. Fallacious as it is in every respect, this argument seems credible to many among the public, the medical, and the scientific community. They all fail to realize that natural radiation and the genetic and chromosomal mutations caused thereby are doing a great deal of harm. The genetic disorders and deaths caused by natural radiations are no different at all from those caused by man-made radiation. We saw in Chapter 2 that all these radiations act similarly and the injuries are no different from one source of radiation than from another. All we can say is that at this moment we know of no way to turn off the various natural sources of radiation. We therefore suffer an enormous toll of disease, debility, and death as a result of natural radiation. As a minimal element of common sense, we should refrain, except under the most dire circumstances, from adding to this enormous burden of, excuse me, from adding to this enormous burden of suffering by adding the injury of man-made radiation. The benefits to society should be required to be enormous, and obviously so before permitting any amount of increase in radiation mutations due to man-made sources. When the argument is raised that natural radiation-induced mutations cannot be harmful since humans have evolved thus far in a, quote, sea of radioactivity, unquote, this argument should be countered with several cogent points. First, 
We have evolved to our present state in spite of radiation. We do have a limited lifespan and we do have an enormous toll of suffering, disease, and premature death due to genetic disorders. And natural radiation probably accounts for 5 to 10 percent of such suffering and disease. We, societally at least, are at least humane enough to devote a sizable share of our funds to medical care and medical research in the endeavor to alleviate the suffering and premature deaths caused by genetic mutation induced disease, some 5 to 10 percent of which is due to the natural radiation. We must assuredly think very seriously of having to expend 10 percent more on medical, and medical care and consider having the massive increase in disease, genetic disease, that would go with man-made radiation exacting a toll comparable with or higher than the toll exacted by natural radiation. Precisely the same foolish argument concerning natural radiation could have been raised concerning poliomyelitis, cholera, typhoid, tuberculosis, yellow fever, diphtheria, and a host of other infectious diseases. Is it, it is extremely likely that the organisms causing such diseases have coexisted on earth with man and other species for millions of years. Would anyone argue that typhoid fever didn't exist, or yellow fever, or poliomyelitis, or bubonic plague, or diphtheria, or cholera? Hardly. In some areas of the world, life expectancy has not been the classical three score and ten, precisely because diseases caused by such organisms took a heavy toll, leading a life to life expectancies very much shorter than they are today. Who would have listened to the argument that the tubercle Basilius was harmless just because man survived as a species in spite of the ravages of tuberculosis. Who would have argued that some who would have argued that some case for the other serious agents of infectious disease? I'm sorry. Who would have argued that same case for the other serious agents of infectious disease? The situation in regard to radiation injury is actually much worse than the situation in regard to infectious diseases, isn't it? Promoters of nuclear energy are saying, in essence, since we already have such and such a level of illness from background radiation, it really doesn't matter if we increase this figure to the same level. In other words, double it. Applying the same logic to infectious disease, Public health officials would say, since we always have 10,000 diseases of ma malaria in the country, it doesn't really matter if we increase the number to 20,000. Man has, with great ingenuity, searched carefully in his environment for causes of serious disease. Where possible, he has altered the environment through sanitation or by immunization procedures, thereby diminishing the enormous toll of infectious disease. What a shame it would have been if man had given up on, at the start and said, poliomyelitis virus has always been with us. Man has evolved in spite of it, and therefore no consideration need to be given to ravages of the polio virus. Precisely how serious are the genetic diseases man suffers from? Extremely serious. This has become increasingly clear to medical authorities from careful studies continuing right up to the present. Before considering the magnitude of the implications of genetically determined diseases, it is important to point out that new mutations of genes and chromosomes are required to maintain the, the occurrences of all diseases that are genetically determined, with rare exceptions. This is so because ordinarily most mutations introduced into a population render the bearer of the mutation slightly or grossly less likely to bear children than are persons with normal unmutated genes of that specific type.
<clears throat> Let us consider the most serious genetic or chromosomal mutation, which one would which would be one which renders the person bearing the mutation absolutely sterile. In such a case, if a mutation occurs in the ovary or testes of a parent, the offspring may carry the mutation in all of its cells, will suffer from the consequences of carrying the mutation, and will fail to reproduce. Thus, this type of mutation will not be propagated in the species beyond the one generation, but it will cause great suffering to the afflicted individual. If over centuries and centuries the various spontaneous sources of mutation have remained constant, then this particular type of disease will have remained constant. The new cases always arising by mutations in the immediately preceding generation. If by man-made radiation we increase mutations by 10%, we can expect an immediate increase of 10% in the very next generation of offspring in this serious type of disease thereby produced. But because of non-reproduction in such offspring, the effect is not transmitted to additional future generations. So this type of effect of an ill-considered, I'm sorry, so this type of effect of an ill-considered allowance of a 10% increase in mutations due to radiation would not continue to persist if we were then to discontinue the radiation. Other genetic mutations do not render the offspring totally sterile, but may reproduce the average reproductive fitness compared to persons from the particular gene of the healthy, unmutated form. From such mutations introduced by spontaneous sources, radiation or other, there is a buildup of such mutations throughout the population until the loss of mutated individuals by lesser reproductive fitness than balances, I'm sorry, then I lost my place. For such mutations introduced by spontaneous sources, radiation and other, there is a buildup of such mutations throughout the population until the loss of mutated individuals by lesser reproductive fitness just balances the introduction of the new mutations of that particular type. I don't know about you, but man, some of these sentences aren't written very well. The human species must have reached equilibrium in this sense, since if spontaneous mutations have been going on for millennia, by now the production rate and loss rate are equal. Disease due to such mutated genes is occurring in every generation. If now we increase the mutation rate by 10% due to man-made radiation and keep on doing this generation after generation, what will happen? Since many people already have that mutation from the previously established equilibrium, we will be adding to that number those due to the increased mutation rate until after some number of generations, not precisely known for it depends on reproductive fitness, the loss of indi individuals by diminished fertility will balance the increment produced by the radiation. In other words, we're just going to cause ourselves to go sterile. We will have a new equilibrium, but now there will be fine there but now there will finally be 10% more individuals in the population bearing the mutation and hence there will be 10% more of the biological damage produced per generation by this particular defective gene or chromosome. The cost in health per generation can be much more serious than it would be expected from just the 10% increase in persons bearing the mutation. We shall see precisely how this can occur as we turn our attention to the kinds of diseases caused by defective genes. I think I'm going to stop here. We're on page 84, new subtitle, What Kind of Genetic Diseases? I'm going to keep reading this as often as I can. I think we need to arm ourselves with this information. Um, this shit is getting serious. 
the so-called scientists in Japan are arguing with each other about whether Fukushima caused, what is it, a 50-fold increase in cancer in their children. They're arguing about their children getting cancer from Fukushima, which is an ongoing disaster because of economic reasons, just like he says in this book. They're giving up their children for money. So we need to read this. I'm going to read this as off quickly as I can. Um, after the 15th of October, I'll have a lot more time, and I'm really going to go power hard on this. But uh, we got to put our courage feet on, you guys, and we got to do a bunch of cleansing. And we have to just, we need to really actually figure out a way to get people actively engaged because this is bullshit. We're just offering up our future generations. First, it's going to be the Japanese children. First, it was the Marshallese. Now, it's going to be the Japanese. And then what? And then who else are they going to kill? I mean, we have 89 times the uranium-tainted water for 6 million people in the United States throughout the middle of America, throughout the central valleys of California, and all along the East Coast. They're all drinking tainted uranium water. We know that New York is drinking tritium. That's just the beginning. We don't even really know because they're not telling us. So uh, that leads me to actually please do contribute to the GoFundMe page. The link will be in there. We are trying to build in the Northwest from Radca for Radcast.org. They want to build a people's lab where anybody can send them uh, food and water supplies. We want to find out what's in our food supply, what's in our water, what's in our milk. What's in our stuff that they're not telling us about? Exactly. And this machine that Radcast wants to buy will uh, be able to test all kinds of nuclear radionuclides. So anyways, you guys, put your courage feet on. We'll talk to you again soon. Ciao.